Hey everybody, and welcome to the first session of Leadership Bluegrass Online, Navigating the Digital Jungle. Leadership Bluegrass is the International Bluegrass Music Association's annual intensive professional development program, building leaders across all areas of bluegrass music. In place of an in-person program this year, we're sharing a taste of Leadership Bluegrass with the entire community through this webinar series that will take place every Thursday in March at 12 Central right here on Facebook. If you'd like to support Leadership Bluegrass and other IBMA programs, please consider donating or becoming a member, and you can find more information at ibma.org. Please make welcome today's moderator, Lee Stivers. Lee has served as the music coordinator for the Whiskey Rebellion Festival in Washington, Pennsylvania since its inception in 2010. A perennial student of bluegrass and other roots music, Lee is an alumni of Leadership Bluegrass, class of 2016. Take it, Lee. Thank you, Nate. Uh, and welcome everyone to The Show Must Go On, producing events in uncertain times. Um, my name is Lee Stivers, and I'm serving today as the moderator of today's panel. We have some great panelists in our discussion today. I'm gonna start with a brief introduction of each of our panel members. Um, and then we're going to have about 45 to 50 minutes for panel discussion, um, followed by a 10 minute um, Q&A period. So please, if you're out there on Facebook watching live, if you have questions, just as we go, just type your questions into the comments um, portion of, of the Facebook page on the event page, and uh, they'll get relayed to us here on the panel. So I'm going to start by um, introducing our panelists, and we'll start with uh, Joe Lurgio. Joe is the general manager of The Caverns, a subterranean music venue in Tennessee, which is the home to PBS's Bluegrass Underground. Mr. Lurgio has also produced musical television specials for PBS, such as Bluegrass Underground, Bluegrass Now, um, Havana Time Machine and songwriter, Songwriting for Soldiers. Um, Joe actually received an Emmy Award for technical achievement on Bluegrass Underground, and he has a long history of planning and promoting live events and has even served on the IBMA staff in the past. Uh, next on the panel, we're welcoming Patrice O'Neill. Patrice is the founder and executive director of Wintergrass. That's a festival held in the Pacific Northwest near Seattle, I think. Um, she's a current member of two bands. Patrice has worked as the director of two acoustic music organizations. She's a recording artist, a visual artist. And when the pandemic hit, Patrice helped guide the festival through a transition from in-person to online events by creating the monthly series Pocket Grass. Uh, and I know I've enjoyed that series as we've gone through this winter. And our third panelist is Seth Young. Seth is the executive director of the Augusta Heritage Center in Elkins, West Virginia. Uh, the Augusta Heritage Center has been a premier educational center for traditional music, arts, and culture for nearly 40 years. I've actually lost track, Seth. You can tell me how many years. Um, Augusta's Bluegrass Week was awarded uh, IBMA's Event of the Year last year. And Seth and Augusta's artistic director, Emily Miller, responded to the pandemic by going fully online with the program as well. Uh, Seth has a long career as a music educator, including serving as the master instrumental music instructor for the West Virginia Governor's School for the Arts. He's a lifelong musician and performer, has toured around the world playing music in a variety of genres. So we welcome all of our panel members. So, it's not news to anyone here that in March of last year, we found ourselves in the midst of this really rapidly developing global pandemic that we've come to call COVID. Uh, live music events are really the lifeblood of the bluegrass music industry and the community. Uh, almost everybody involved in producing live music events, um, we've all been kind of desperately trying to figure out how to plan, how to budget, whether or not to cancel or postpone events. And even if it's possible to hold any type of live events and keep artists, the workers and supporting businesses and the audiences safe. And we understand that people's careers and livelihoods have been crippled and that solutions that keep people safe are needed to uh, 
to, to move forward in this, this, this issue. So I'm gonna jump right into questions here and, and uh, ask the panel, maybe I'll ask Joe to respond to my first question. And that is, you know, looking back over this past year, what were the most critical considerations for you in planning and presenting an event during this pandemic? Well, thank you for having me first off and for putting this together. Um, I think the, you know, there, the first thing was that we had to build a new venue, which didn't even exist at the, at, so we, we've gone through multiple phases here of not even having a venue. And we'd like to say that necessity is really the mother of invention. And we've really been breathing that this year because we wouldn't have survived this just to be frank, if we didn't pivot and create a new venue and somehow figure out how to do this. Um, but some of the key, the key things that we've, we've been walking this, this fine line on is communication, which every event that I've been involved in, and I know every event, you, you always have to struggle to communicate to people about what is the event gonna be like? Where are you gonna get water? How are you gonna take showers? But now you're, you know, you're, you're having to, it's an exponential amount of communication because you're trying to communicate to the bands and their crew and their teams trying to um, communicate to your own crew. And in some cases, I guess, volunteers and um, staff about what you're doing to protect them and their families. Um, and of course you're trying to get, not only are you trying to educate the fans who and patrons who bought tickets, but you also have to educate people prior to them buying tickets. So communication has been a huge part of what we're doing. And, and as much as we do communicate, you know, the message doesn't always get across. Uh, our key has been to use video. We've created a video of a successful event that we did. And that's been key to communicating to everybody, even our crew and their families, to the, the artist teams to see what we're doing. Um, and another thing that I, I guess is uh, that you know, we're doing a pod based model, which a lot of people have adopted some sort of drive in. It's a similar to a drive in where you come in and you're in an unknown space that other people are not in with you. Um, and we do pods in of two, four, or six people. And, um, but they're not equal to tickets. You know, that's something that we've, you're selling um, a pod and you're trying to convince people to come either as a group of two, four or six. And when you're selling them a, a pot, it's not the same as selling a ticket. And we're still learning about that. It's ongoing battle here. You know, we're, we're dealing with that right now. I think different audiences are buying pods in different ways. And maybe we'll get into that more later, but the bluegrass audience doesn't seem to be as aggressive with buying pods with other people. I think jam bands seem to be buying or more open to buying pods with other people. Um, nothing against jam band fans, <laughs> just the fact that I think we're seeing. And uh, also that assumptions are um, your enemy. And we always know that anytime you're doing anything, assumptions are your enemy. But, but this, this pandemic has, has unearthed assumptions that we never even, you know, they, they were like the paradigm of how we do our business. And, and in some ways they've been, um, you know, even just to the details of catering and how you feed people is something that you can no longer just assume you're going to have a caterer show up and lay out food. But those are three things to, for me that have been major cornerstones as we move through this. Thank you, Joe. And I think we'll probably get into a little more detail on some of those as we go along. Patrice, you know, how about from your perspective, what are maybe uh, if you were looking back at if you're starting over again in February of 2020, what three things do you know now that you wish you'd known then? Well, you know, we're we're in kind of a an odd spot, kind of a kind of a lucky spot in a lot of ways, in that we were probably the last live music event that a lot of people around here went to. Um, because we ha our festival happened right as COVID was blooming. Um, and the first recorded death of COVID happened about just a few miles from where our our festival happens. So I think everybody feels like like they dodged a bullet. Um, and so we, um, I, I think the, the things that have emerged as really important are, are going to be common to everybody, certainly finances. Um, we, we, you know, our whole business model just got completely upended. Um, and we, 
we uh, decided to cancel the 21 event really early um, where people are like, are you out of your mind? What's the matter with you? You know, it's like, no, not going to happen. Um, but, but I think um, a, a, a concern that, that's been consistent all year long and, and as we look forward to 2022 is the culture. Um, because we're pretty sure that when people come back to Wintergrass, it's going to be different. Just like it's going to be different to almost any event. There's going to be some difference and it's not going to feel the same. And so we're very mindful of guarding that culture. In our case, it's just like, yeah, come on into this fancy hotel. It's yours. Put your feet on the furniture. No sweat. Gather as, you know, as much as you want. Go anywhere you want. Do whatever you want. And, and that's probably not going to be true even as late as February 2022. So we're mindful, mindful of that. And um, I think if there was one thing that we wanted to know about and be better at, it, had we known in February, it would be getting up to speed on video capacity and capabilities and um, putting information, putting content out. That was, that was a steep climb for us and we're still climbing, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Thanks, Patrice. Seth, you want to take a give give us a, your thoughts on this question of you know what do you wish you had known back then when you were making these decisions? Yeah, when we first started, we had a, a meeting over the phone. We were already on lockdown, and I had um, I had the feeling that what we were doing was like building a lifeboat while we were already struggling with swimming in the water, basically. <laughs> You know, it was very challenging in the early days. And, um, you know, it wasn't only we were building a lifeboat, but uh, like Joe said, communicating what you're doing, because everybody had to build a new schema for how things were going to, uh, you know, go in the future. And so we built an online learning platform that hosts pre recorded lessons where you could chat with the individual instructors. We also had um, a Zoom lesson series that we would record and put an archive on there. And so we built a new website in about four weeks. There was no beta testing of anything. You know, it was like uh, from ground zero to into our users' hands in that time. So knowing how a user would interact with it, having better tutorials on on different things and then and then you know th there was no focus group before it was in light speed uh in tech terms which is very quick um just knowing how we could widen the accessibility to this content um we knew that we had to do something we had to do it quickly we were really worried about two things number one is we represent um some underserved communities here at the Augusta Heritage Center, where we felt like if we took a year off or, or you know, um, didn't help those communities stay connected and engaged, that something would happen to those communities that would disconnect them and it would be harder to bring them back when we came back. And then the other thing was, you know, um, both Emily, the artistic director, and myself, uh, a great portion of our career before we came to the Augusta Heritage Center was as touring performers. So when we started talking to everybody that was just facing an unknown time of um, not working, basically, uh, we both knew we didn't want to call them and say, hey, we're canceling until 2021. We'll hire you as feasible. We wanted to have an answer to the, to the challenges that we faced. And so when we worked with all our granting agencies, the donors, everybody that, that makes Augusta go, um, you know, just being able to make a call and say, hey, we're not going to be able to go live, but we are going to go online and we would like to hire your services, that, that meant something. And that was worth all, all of the hard work. Um, so, you know, we're still navigating as we speak. I don't, I don't know if we can talk about hindsight quite yet here because I still feel like we're kind of in it. But, um, you know, the, the, those first couple months were pretty rocky. There, there was about a 24 hour a day customer service factor to it as everybody got used to the new technology and, and uh, getting their feet under them for what was 
going to happen for the near future. Great. Um, yeah, this is, I think your responses to this first question really have brought up some of the, the bigger topics and, and we can tackle those kind of one at a time. Let's just, let's jump into the money side because that's what is always a, an important factor in making any of these kinds of events happen, whether they're for profit or not profits, you got to have some, some money to cover costs. Let's talk about, you know, maybe the financial impacts of, of wh whether you've got new stuff online or whether you're still doing things live. Um, you know, were you able to, in this past year, have you been, how have you been able to recoup fees to the best that you could, you know, expenses, covering expenses, whether it's online or in person? Patrice, do you wanna, wanna tackle that one? Sure, um, we, um, actually I've been kind of blown away at um, how things have worked out when we, um, canceled 2021 we'd already sold a boatload of tickets a lot um, and that's our custom and that generates income that we live on for the rest of the year until we start really selling tickets um, so we refunded all of that fully right away um, and that kind of drained our bank account um, so we uh, are a nonprofit we have a board that's really smart really good and have a lot of foresight and so we had amassed a, a good reserve fund. So we met, you know, talked about how we were going to use the reserves, not just willy nilly. They set an amount like, okay, this, this amount will get us through this year. Um, and we're going to hang on to this amount so that we, when we do come back, we have enough seed money to get going. Um, and then we decided that we didn't want to just sit around and do nothing. It's kind of like what Seth was saying. We wanted to be able to produce something. Um, and we wanted to be able to produce some small amount of income for, for artists and for, you know, crew and, and people. And it's small, granted, but at least it was something. So we made that commitment early on. Um, and the thing that has blown me away is how generous people have been. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of support that's come to us from the community and because we were doing something um, that enabled us to get a whole lot of unexpected grant money but we had to be doing something and that that was critical um, so so we've got both pocket grass and a youth academy program and a youth orchestra all of those things are still happening they're all virtual but there's something and they are the reason that we've had great support and we're in we're in good shape we still need that support but we're in good shape and we're going to be ready to put on a 2022 festival whatever that looks like mm -hmm. so joe you folks have been doing live events still so maybe less of a pivot than our other two panelists what you know and you mentioned talked about ticketing and pod the pod model what other kinds of impacts have you seen do you work with do you deal with sponsors or advertisers or something how does that picture change we we for the our ticketed venue the caverns um yeah we we mainly are we're open to sponsors if anybody's out there but no we we're, we rely we rely heavily on hard tickets to to do our business i think i represent on this panel, the independent promoter venue, um, right? I'm not sure anybody else. I think we're all doing different things, but um, yeah. so yeah, we're, we're surviving off of our ticket sales. And, um, you know, we had close to a million dollars in refunds that went last year. Um, I'm being, you know, completely transparent. It was a, an amazingly rough experience. And um, I'm glad that, I'm still here to talk about it, meaning like, but yeah, both, you know, I didn't get COVID, but having getting through the pandemic, but also that the business has survived the pandemic because we, you know, we're still not out of it yet and we're not um, even close to it. And the, the Save Our Stages Act, which is now um, called SBOG, is, is something that we actually have as a budget line item. So we don't know how much we're going to get, but we look at it um, and we need it to move forward. Now, we, we have created a path uh, for survival 
that um, you know, but it but it means a lot of uh, of sacrifice, and it's just it's really difficult because we basically had a you know just to give a short little history, we we created a new venue for Bluegrass Underground, which is our television show, and it's which is the Caverns, and we we intended to do a lot more hard ticketed shows there, make this a live music venue all year round that was focused on all genres of music that still hosted the PBS show there. And um, we only did that three years ago. We opened up in 2018 with Sam Bush and Billy Strings on our opening weekend for our P first PBS taping. Janet Riley was there and um, it was, so we, we literally dug a hole in the ground that has, was also a money hole in the ground, cost a lot of money to dig that hole. And um, you know, we weren't out of that hole when the pandemic hit but we were actually in 2020 looking to finally get our head above water. So when this happened, it, it hit, it hit us really hard. And um, yeah, so, so I'm being positive in that we, we created this venue above ground. We took this field that we have and we took, you know, we, we worked with some local contractors and we took trees down and um, we created this beautiful amphitheater that we didn't even know was there. It was just this green field. And then, you know, we, we parked cars on it and our crew used to hang out up there after shows. And now it's become, um, it's a 1000 capacity venue in COVID, which is allowing us to keep our lights on and uh, pay our, you know, be able to, to keep our crew on and keep our, our staff on. Um, but that venue now is gonna exist beyond COVID. And it's one of many uh, smaller, it's the biggest, but there's lots of other things that are going to be positives for us that come out of it. But one is, is now we have an outdoor venue that I think will eventually seat 35 to 5,000 cap without COVID restrictions. Mm -hmm. So Joe, with the reliance on ticketing, have you, did you encounter specific challenges with the ticketing agency with the, I mean, you don't necessarily have control over that, or do you see that as a, a challenge in the future? Yeah, I mean, we like I said in the beginning, there's these assumptions that we were working under and paradigms that we were working under that really got the, the rug got pulled out from under us. And the biggest was, you know, when the pandemic hit, we started getting all these refund requests from people who, um, once we started rescheduling shows to 2021 or even later, just in the beginning, it was just rescheduling to later in 2020. People didn't, you know, they didn't want their money held up anymore. And we... Um, what the ticketing companies started to do though, which we didn't know in the beginning, we didn't have the foresight to see it coming, was that they started to um, get nervous about that money because they were actually the ones who were on the hook for it because they were the for in, in the situation that we happened to be in, they were the ticket processor, uh, the credit card processor. And it's really complicated, but the moral of the story is, is they, you know, a lot of venues are used to getting advanced ticket money. So when you make a ticket sale and that point of sale goes through, just like if you go to the supermarket and you buy a gallon of milk, that money goes to the store, you know, but the difference in the ticketing world is that the product hasn't been delivered yet. You don't get your, you get your tickets, but you don't get the delivered concert experience until a later date, right? So you've gone through the checkout line and you walk out with without the product. You're basically saying to the, to the point of sale saying, I trust that you're gonna be there to provide this concert at a later date. And that's where the ticketing companies kind of popped their heads up about two, three months after this and said, hey, we're no longer gonna give you any of this money that comes in. So the little bit of money that we had trickling in through people who were still buying tickets or even if a band came to us and said, hey, we want to do a concert with you. We wanna do a live stream or do something that would require them to you know swipe a credit card at the ticketing company the ticketing company was refusing to give us any revenue anymore so they basically held all this money and it's not that it's just that that was something we had lived uh, we just assumed was the way that we did business and, and um it, it really it was a double whammy because one you have all these requests coming in for refunds and then at the same time your little bit of revenue that was coming in gets all of a sudden shut off. And, and you didn't even think that was an option for them to shut that off because you had assumed that that's just the paradigm that you did business in for so long. But those contracts can be very lengthy and they will embed things in there to um, 
you know, protect themselves. And that's, I guess, what a contractor is for. But. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So Seth, what, um, you know, talk to us a little bit about how the, the financial picture kind of changed with Augusta going from the traditional program to an online. You, you had a pretty bold uh, approach to pricing, I remember. Yeah, um, so before the, the pandemic hit, um, our revenue streams were you, you paid tuition to be here, you could pay for room and board or meals. So there's room sales, meal sales, tuition sales. Then there were our granting agencies, uh, the National Endowment for the Arts, West Virginia Department of Arts, Culture, and History, West Virginia Humanities Council, and then donations. So that in a typical year before pre-pandemic, those would have been all of our revenue streams. When we started talking about what we could do to make something happen after the pandemic, one of the things that was clear to us was, you know, we're working on something that is unproven and entirely new. You know, we started researching uh, to put, a fair, our accountants wanted us to put a fair market value on what we were doing. And it was very difficult to do so um, because there was, you know, th this was a prototype of uh, content delivery. And we also recognized that this, the pandemic has had a very uneven financial effect, particularly early on when uh, a lot of folks were getting furloughed, there were service industry employees that were entirely laid off. I mean, there was just every tier of society was impacted so greatly. So what we wanted to focus on was making our um, programming widely accessible to everyone. And um, uh, I wouldn't, I hope my CFO is not listening, but we chose to focus on completing good work and letting the money follow that good work rather than how are we gonna make this, this money. Uh, and so um, what we did was we created it. We said, we put a fair market value on it, but it was only for tax purposes. So you could donate at any level to gain access to all the content that we were generating. If you donated over the fair market value, you would get a tax receipt for, for that overage. And, um, you know, it was something like, uh, you know, 83% of participants donated over the fair market value. So it was... Um, it was quite compelling. And I will tell you that right now to this day, the lifeblood of this organization and the reason that I can sit here at my desk with the lights on is our just hundreds of donors that have come forward with those $50, $100, $200 gifts. It's just been amazing. I mean, that, that in lieu of losing all that revenue from meal sales, from, from room sales, and even from tuition sales, concert tickets, all the things that we would have done in a normal year, um, the donors that have wanted to see this, it's a 48-year-old organization, um, live into the future, have really stepped up and, and, and allowed us to survive and thrive. I will remind everybody that we're not out of the woods and those donations are just as important now as they were on day one. But I think we've put ourselves in a really unique position where we can concentrate on other areas that the organization is, is growing in, such as the digitization of our archives. Um, we have for years produced documentaries under the Augusta Heritage Center label. We've just made those free for dissemination and are having a rollout of those documentaries. Um, our cultural sessions, you know, we had one with Tim O'Brien the other day. It has 14,000 views. If we had had Tim on our campus, we would have 150, 200 people able to be in attendance. So there are some silver linings to what's happening here. Um, but for us, it really has been about keeping everything that we do so service oriented and, and our, the, the participants of Augusta Heritage Center activities have really just kept everything together for us moving forward. So I can't thank them enough. All right. Thanks. Uh, I want to transition now, maybe start focusing a little bit more on, you know, the COVID policies, COVID safety stuff that either you did through this past year or you see 
happening um, in the in the immediate future. And I want to start with Joe. There's a, been a number of questions popping up in our Facebook comments, wanting people wanting to know more about um, about the pods. Like, what? Tell, tell us a little more detail about what you mean by those and how they're working and what they accomplish. Yeah, so I mean, the pods are just, you know, once they're at the show, basically all of our walking paths in the actual amphitheater or the outdoor venue are uh, 13 feet wide. So, and that gives six, you know, we're using this six foot guidance that the CDC put out. So it's six feet on either side for one way foot traffic with a foot in the middle to separate them. And then the pods themselves, we have each person has 10 foot, 10 square feet in the pod, right? And all we really did, it's not really rocket science. We just took um, agriculture stakes. They're like, you buy them at Tractor Supply Company. No, we're, we're, they wanna be a sponsor, give us a call, but they're not. But uh, you just put these stakes in the ground, you put in uh, four of them in the ground, and then you you know use something that doesn't disturb the view of the stage. You gotta be really careful because people could sit on a blanket or sit on a lawn chair and you wanna make sure that you're not cutting um, the viewpoint from somebody behind them or even their own in the pod. And um, they're one way entrances so that you can only go, you know, it's, it's a, it's a three-sided square. So you we're telling them basically, okay, this, this is how you go in and out of your, your pen. And a lot of people have sarcastically, you know, commented on our Facebook, post calling it um, people sheep or whatever. And um, it, you know, at the end of the day, it is, you know, we're kind of guiding people with these, with the pods and, and it's, a, it's a nice little safe place. And each pod is six feet away from another pod. And then the walking paths are 13 foot distances. And you have to buy, you can't just buy an individual ticket. You have to buy a pod. And, and the way you set that up is just do a min max on the ticket. So it's, you know, you have to, have, for each, ticket type, it's for a two person pod, it has to be a minimum per two and a maximum of two. So they're forced to buy two of that ticket type. Um, so they are actually getting two barcodes or scanner, scannable tickets at the end of their purchase. Same thing with the fours, it's a min max of a four and they um, get four barcodes or four tickets at the end of the purchase. Um, yeah. That, that's basically the pods are, you know, it's just the same as if you were, you know, there's no car, you know, you still park in a parking lot and you walk up to your pod. And who is, who is um, enforcing? Movement? Well, we have, um, we have somebody who has called himself the pod father. <laughs> no, there, there are, we, we do have a guy on our staff named Brian and he is, uh, he, he actually is the one who's out there, you know, this, it's not easy to begin with, let me say that. He, we work really, really, really hard because we're trying to maximize every square inch we have of real estate to um, get these bands the most amount of money that, that we can get them, right? You know, we don't want, they don't want to come out there and see a big empty patch of grass and ask us why we didn't use that. Um, so every, we're, we're using every single pod that we can, you know, this old school world, put me on the comp list, you know, it just, it doesn't exist. Um, we have surveyed out down to every square inch where these pods are and they don't move, they just stay stagnant. So it's not like we're going from show to show and changing our pod configuration. We know um, how many we can get and we, we try to get as many as we can of the smaller pods, but um, because they sell better, the twos and the fours are, are a more desirable ticket purchase than a six person pod, but it gets hard to keep your capacity up um, when you start adding lots of twos and four person pods, when in, you could be using that space to put six person pods. So it's a little bit of a balance. We actually, it's kind of like a, a bell curve with the two person pods over here, four person pods here, uh, sorry, the two person pods here, the six person pods here, and then the four person pods in the middle with the most amount of the pods being fours. And then on show days, we have um, our ushers who are normally in the venue um, when we were inside, they've all come outside and they are out there masked with, um, you know, double masked out there and they're in the aisle showing people where to go. And we have security obviously that is posted throughout the venue who helps enforce um, people staying in their pods. But for the most part, thus far, luckily, you know, um, patrons have been more than willing to stay in their pods. They're, they want to get into their pods and stay there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, 
So Seth, with Augusta looking into you know upcoming season and and um, what you folks are planning to do, I think you mentioned something about having some maybe live events. Tell us a little more about how you're thinking about COVID safe policies in order to keep everybody uh, safe for that. Sure, we're having. Um what we'll refer to as a gradual re-entry into live events in, in lieu of, um, you know, going from zero to a hundred from quarantining into uh, classic week-long immersive educational and uh, concert experiences. Uh, so what we're going to do for the foreseeable future is a hybrid model where some of the programming will be online and some of it will be in person. Um, it'll, again, employ a very flexible registration um, fee when you're, when you're purchasing the, the online content because we want it to be as wide access as possible. So right now we're working with everyone that we had contracted to be on campus um, this summer teaching a class. And they're going to generate both pre-recorded educational content and uh, teach live Zoom sessions that will be recorded for later. Uh, now we want to be as flexible with this programming as we can because the world is much different. What we invented to do last su summer isn't what we need to be doing this summer. We're not all quarantined on lockdown and thinking we're going to die if we go to Walmart or whatever, but we do need to keep distant and keep safe. And it, it is ill-advisable probably to fly people in from all corners of the globe to execute programming and, and square dances. And I'll tell you this, Lee, my, one of my barometers is, you know, there's this, uh, in our square dance pavilion, there's a, a water barrel that you push that, that ha you know, you get your own water out of it when you're having, uh, uh, when you're square dancing. And I just think about, can we push this water button? Do we have to staff somebody now to, to do water and, and the coffee? We would have these coffee crafts all over the place and for the in-between times and snacks laying out. And, you know, it's just, it's a completely different world right now. So what we're going to do is educational component. Um, we're going to move online and we're going to begin with outdoor um, concerts, day events, outdoor workshops, much like what Joe says. Uh, has been doing. We're, we have a blacksmithing pavilion that has four coal-fired forges, and we feel that there'll be a time soon when we can start to program those type of activities. Then instead of saying, you know, we'll see in summer of 2022, as it becomes safe to do so, we're pursuing three-day conference model uh, programming. So in, instead of coming to Bluegrass Week, We'll, you can come to Bluegrass Weekend. Uh, tickets will be limited to that. It'll be smaller in scope, but you'll have a much more intimate experience with the instructors. Um, and there is the possibility that we would ask everyone that be a part of that to be vaccinated. Um, you know, if it gets into that kind of gray zone on the infection rate versus the, the vaccination rate. So as we move forward, we've got to have a real safety first mentality. And everybody here knows that this type of programming doesn't work on a dime. I mean, it's like 18 months of prep time to make certain that you're uh, got all your ducks in a row here. And so to, to say, you know, the governor lifts restrictions a week from now, let's execute this in six weeks. It just, it, it really isn't possible nor advisable to do so. So right. we're facing in live events, but it, it's not gonna be, um, you know, from doing nothing to doing everything overnight. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. And thank you for mentioning vaccines. I, you know, the news on that is just, it's very, it's changing every day. Um, but I, but people have questions about it. Um, and I, I'll just ask Patrice and Joe, do either one of you have, you know, where do vaccines play in your, into your decision making or planning for the future? Are you going to you know, will you start requiring vaccinations? Or are you going to take a wait and see? What's what's up with that? Um, we're, you, I, I think that for a festival, um, like, like, unlike, like Joe and Seth, we're a once a year thing. Um, and I think a lot of a lot of folks in the bluegrass world are, are in that boat. Um, and, and 
as as Seth just said, you have to plan a long time in advance, 12, 18 months in advance. You have to be making some really important decisions. Um, I think it's really important to pick what you're going to do, make understand what you're going to sell, and stick to it and not change your mind. As far as, as vaccines go, um, we, we're – Wintergrass is right in the midst now of doing something. Seth was talking earlier about all of the variables and how things change all the time, and it, there's so much uncertainty, and how do you plan, and it's like trigonometry, and that's true. So Wintergrass has a thing that we've instituted called Operation Octopus, um, which is looking at all of these different aspects of of coming back in, you know, full on into a live situation. And certainly one of those things is going to be um, vaccines. Um, personally, um, I'm, I'm all ready to just say, yep, you're going to have to show proof of, of vaccination to come in the doors. But I think we're going to talk about that and we're going to take surveys of people you know, going on something that Joe said about communication. I think that is critical. And so we are doing quasi regular surveys of our of our folks and kind of taking their temperature as it were um, about about all of those things but I I think that just from what we're hearing so far from artists fans and and our own staff is there's such a range of of comfort level um, that you're, there's no way you're going to be able to satisfy everybody. I know that there's going to be people in our audience to say, no way am I going to get a vaccine and show you my card. Forget it, you know. And there's going to be a people on the other side of the thing saying, no way am I going to an event unless you can assure me that everybody there is vaccinated. So I, th I think that we just have to, like, choose our poison um, and and put our heads down and go with it. Mm hmm Joe, anything on vaccinations? I think I think I I'm kind of in line with with well with, with what Patrice said. I think we're just taking it day by day and monitoring what's going on and just you know the market is helping us you know as we're, we're actually selling tickets, so it's we're getting live feedback and trying to understand um, at least what the market is telling us. We're reading what other people are doing, obviously with the bigger players like Live Nation is doing is going to kind of set a paradigm that the rest of us might have to um, fit into or that it, hopefully they take some good leadership steps that we can all follow and and, con and consumers will have expectations that we might all have to meet I think um, and we're just kind of watching that and seeing where it goes I think you know we're hoping that everybody gets who wants to take a vaccine is going to be able to have the opportunity to take a vaccine and at that point you know um, it might the, the climate may have changed at that point as to how we look at people with a card and without a card or but again I thought we hey last March we were rescheduling shows three months out so you know I, I, this thing is a beast that we just can't see that far ahead on you know so before we go into the Q&A period and we've got some really good questions coming in and I uh, I hope that people will keep typing in their questions onto the Facebook comments um I want to get back to the online um, things that now that we have two panelists who your organizations have you know pivoted to online and there's all kinds of questions about that and Joe maybe what you can think about is are you folks planning to do something online in the future but let's just start with maybe a, a kind of logistical question of what kind of virtual platforms have you used and what kind of challenges and Maybe silver linings have you have you found with virtual platforms? Patrice sighed, so that means she has something. To say. <laughs> I, I want to hear what Seth has to say. I, I need to learn a couple of things from him here. <laughs> but, um, okay, so so I would say that of the three of us, I'm probably the dumbest one about these things. So I'm I'm starting from zero. Um, and because we've never had uh, a virtual or, or streaming event associated with our, our festival. It's always been live, you know, not worried about cameras, not worried about bandwidth, any of that sort of stuff. Um, I think 
that we know that from here on out we have to have that we have to have either a live streamed or a streamed component to the festival those are two very different things um, and we have to understand the capacities that we need to build in order to do that um, we started out doing a whole bunch of research um, we watched a gazillion webinars went to a gazillion online events um, made lists of what we liked and what we didn't like um, did demos with a lot of different companies that were providing platforms and this is like way back in the in the late spring um, so there were a lot of existing um, platforms and by platforms I mean somebody who takes your information and pushes it out so zoom is a platform zoom is a simple ubiquitous platform and it has pluses and minuses but there are other um, more uh, vigorous and um, uh, beefy beefy programs that have existed for a while um, in the business world that are uh, geared for conferences um, IBMA used one of those um, platforms earlier um, to do the world of bluegrass um, so what we're where we are right now is not where we're going to be by the time we get around to our live event again but right now we opted to do after looking at all these fancy things we opted to do the lowest common denominator simplest things that we could possibly do so we have just relied on YouTube and Facebook we hate Facebook we like YouTube. <laughs> you know? um, because that there there's like no barriers with with those two platforms for doing what we are are doing when it comes time to do a live event again and we want to have a virtual component that's a different story it's a different story talking with agents and artists too that's a whole other can of worms there it's a good can of worms but it's you know still something to deal with that we haven't dealt with in the past so now now Seth you you tell everybody all the good stuff that you learned <laughs> So I'm going to throw another question that you related, and that is, you know, what's your opinion about market saturation? I mean, there's an awful oh. lot of stuff online now. There's uh, a ton. I, I mean, one of the things that we learned super early on, uh, yeah, I mean, everybody was just flying by the seat of their pants last summer, for sure. And everybody was just making it up as you go. But we made a decision really early on that we were not going to produce anything that was lengthy because people are oversaturated they're done you know you spend so much time looking at your screen these days and there is a ton there's thousands and thousands of things that you could see on any given day so the stuff that we've produced so far has been under an hour um and boy when you when you start approaching an hour people get itchy and and walk away um for a festival um i think that would definitely be something that we um, factor in. Um, I don't think we're, we'd be interested in just turning the cameras on and doing a live stream. Mm -hmm. um, it's too long. Um, so maybe that means we pick and choose some stuff, which means editing, which means time and expense um, and a different kind of pushing things out. So it's, it's a complicated little beast. Um, <laughs> Seth, you, you've talked about what Augusta's done online and what they're planning to do. You know, thoughts on platforms and, and maybe any things that you see different in the future and what your thoughts are on the market saturation. Sure. Um, you'll be surprised to know that I'm not any kind of techie type person. Um, you know, even in my recording career, I would just watch Pro Tools on the screen like it was some, you know, fancy colors going by and I would just play when they told me and, and not when when it was not time to play. So, you know, what I what I knew is like, you know, you have a vision in your mind, is it possible to bring it to life? So I'm not exactly certain about some of the you know, some of the aspects even of this website, but I'll speak to them to my best of my ability. We do have um, a hosting software for hosting videos on a website. Um, this allows participants to log in and view any of our lessons at any time that they want to. 
Uh, we also have a, a comment feature that sends an email to that instructor, letting them know that somebody commented on their video. And that is a good way to have like back and forth questions also not beholden to real time because as we move forward you know um, we want to make everybody's experience as, as flexible as possible so that's one component to our online programming is, is, is a pre-recorded content that um, that you can chat back and forth with the other uh, large component does take place on zoom um, we view that as a real important real-time interaction with some instructors and there have actually been a lot of benefits to, to Zoom that I see sticking around. Um, you know, I, I think at first we all thought it was a fad, just like you thought TV was a fad or radio was a fad or the internet was a fad. I think that this will, uh, this type of thing that we're doing here, regardless of platform, will continue on into the future because simply because even in non-pandemic times, th this, this meeting right here probably would not have been feasible in person to get all of us together, to get everybody uh, all over the country watching. It's a great tool um, to utilize. So we do use Zoom. It does have its limitations. You can't, uh, we call them music making events. They're as close to jams as we can get where we'll have a master artist, they're unmuted, they're playing repertoire. And then, you know, uh, people from all over the world can be playing along with them in their own home. And it's uh, kind of amazing how your brain puts puts the sound together. Because some of those times when I'm looking at these thumbnail screens of people from all over the, the world playing these various instruments, I can hear in my head what the song sounds like with all those instruments playing. The other added benefit to that is you get to play whatever you want without anybody hearing you. So it's a great time to practice some stuff that you're totally unsure about performing in a live jam session. Uh, mm -hmm. So I've been making great use of that feature. And then um, we have had our Zoom sessions, the ones that are, um, uh, particularly the ones that are sponsored by the West Virginia Humanities Council are free and open to the public. So we stream those over to our Facebook page. Then much like what the IBMA is doing right now, we'll uh, watch the comments in the chat on Zoom and both over in Facebook. And we'll ask you know, the presenter questions that come in in real time. Um, and then YouTube premieres have been another thing that is so surprisingly social. So we've had a series of documentaries that we'll set up a premiere for. We'll let every one of our um, participants know via email that we're premiering something and here's the link. And then when, when you show up and you're commenting and using that chat function, it really does feel like you're in a room with a bunch of friends watching something and talking to them in real time. And uh, we've premiered concerts like that as well. And those have had this strange impact where you feel like you're having a private house concert with your favorite audience, but at the same time, you're with all of your best friends. And it's, it's a very, you know, it's a kind of a unique uh, feeling. Yeah, and I, and I can say I've uh, participated in a number of those this winter and they've been really, really fantastic. Not quite the same as playing together, but yeah. we're going to a concert, but it's been pretty nice. So um, I want to um, go through the uh, some of the questions that have come in, and one of them, Joe, was one I alluded to before. Was um, are are you are you considering doing some kind of online presence, or or having heard all of this, are you going to run away screaming from online? <laughs> you mean at the caverns? Yeah, at the caverns. Um, I mean, we we yeah we we've now you know I, I would actually build on what what everybody else just said and say that. I've, and now that we're, we're actually working with artists actively on a regular basis again, you know, because the prep, we're in, we're in full gear here because we have shows, we have thousand cap shows starting next weekend um, that the, the artists are turned on to video a lot more than they were before and see it as a, a new revenue stream that isn't foreign to them. And as a, you know, as a promoter, we, we really dug deep into, hey, we put our blinders on and knew that we had to sell tickets to get out of this situation. We weren't, for us, the, you know, we had some people coming to us trying to do some streaming stuff and it, and, and, and it, it, wasn't, it wasn't what we need, saw as the thing we needed to do to keep ourselves in business because we needed to do what we know how to do and that's move tickets and, and put on shows and promote concerts. And, um, and 
But now what I'm finding is that all these bands who for the last year had to get resourceful, they teamed up with technical people and they're all coming to us and saying, hey, we want to bring, or a lot of them are coming to us saying, we want to bring um, streaming to you. We're gonna, we're basically touring with, or not touring, but they're doing their one-off shows with a streaming package as, as they wanna do as a, as a part of the deal, which is great because for us, if it's a sold out show, it's just more revenue that they that, that to help them out and they give us a little cut of it and we don't really have to do anything. Actually, one, one of the companies is that's come up is this company called mandolin.com, which I got to figure out why he's um, or she is calling it mandolin.com. And I can't believe nobody in the bluegrass community owns bluegrass, I mean, mandolin.com, but this, this streaming platform does. I, I, can, I, can I just say a couple quick things? Because I think there are some really positive things that we've come, we've walked away from out of this. We did a four night run with Jason Isbell in September in these pods. Um, we did four nights at a thousand, uh, it was 680 cap. Um, there are some real positives that we walked away with that we're going to hopefully continue to move forward with into the non COVID world. But people were not up in other people's faces. There wasn't like situations where you felt like the people were shoulder to shoulder and you know this uncomfortable thing where people are putting elbows into other people. We were forced to have to space people apart and it gave people a better concert experience from the patron side. Um, we, we, we're using an app for all of our concession, concessions and merchandise and um, there's no merch stands or concession stands. Everybody downloads the app before they get there. Again, we had to communicate that to them but it's a VIP experience your merchandise and all of your drinks and all of your food are delivered right to your pod. So you don't have to go anywhere. And I'm, we're really hoping to figure out a way to, to bring that into the non COVID world with us because it's a great experience for fans and they can pre-order merchandise and concessions. And you can kind of get a sense as to how much demand there is for food and drinks and not over order on certain things. And if you want to do a show poster that's commemorative and you want to sell, you know, 200 of them, you can have it as a pre-order on the app for that specific event. And you can know, oh, okay, we're probably only gonna sell 150. Let's only print whatever you wanna print versus doing an overprint of like 300 posters and sitting on them and, and everyone's unhappy with that. And we did staggered arrival times and we're doing staggered arrival times. So not the whole crowd doesn't arrive at one time. No traffic anymore. There's no traffic. People can just drive in and they're coming in small groups of, you know, car, there's probably about 50 to 60 cars in each one of these staggered arrival times is what we're calling it. They're not waiting in giant lines. You know, the parking lot is not a mess. It's, um, it's been, um, it, th there's some other positives that are coming out of it, but that, that's just a few of them that I could think of. We're gonna get upgrades to our bathroom facilities, which means contactless, you know, and, and we're hoping to get a grant through the state for this. But um, con everything's contactless. You know, you don't want to be touching the toilet seats to flush. You know, no flushing. The handles will all have like a foot thing on them, so you can use a, a your foot to open and shut the doors. The sinks all be upgraded to have. Um, you know, you just put your hand in front of it, and the water comes out, so we don't have to have contact. Bathrooms are critical. Yeah, bath critical. bathrooms are critical. Your, your comments here really are just more evidence that I think we can all agree that nothing is ever going to be exactly the same as it was. We're not really going back. We're going to have some of the things that we had in the past, many of them, but there's things will change and, and have already changed. Uh, we have um, just about run out of time. Um, I think I got most of the questions, but not all. Um, and I think we're, I'm going to uh, turn it back over to Nate, who will introduce us to our bluegrass. Thanks again to all the panel members. This has been really an interesting discussion. Thank you. All right. Well, that was really awesome. Thank you to Lee, Seth, Joe, and Patrice for joining us today. And thanks to Janet Brightly from the Leadership Bluegrass Planning Committee and Lori Greenberg. Oh, my video wasn't on. <laughs> and Lori Greenberg, uh, the chair of the alumni committee, uh, they put this session together. They did an awesome job. Uh, Leadership Bluegrass Online will continue next week. We're going to have a discussion about the Music Modernization Act and a performance by the often heard from the UK.